a lot of you are concerned about these things. Uh, before we get started, uh, if we could start with the Pledge of Allegiance and our flag. Right here. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you could remain standing for one moment. Uh, typically in our meetings we have a moment of silence. Uh, this month, if we could have a moment of silence for all of the victims, the flood victims in Texas, uh, I believe the 31 people have passed away. Uh, there's an enormous amount of damage throughout the state of Texas. So if we could have a moment of silence uh, in support of the people of Texas. Thank you. I believe Gretchen has passed out the uh, meeting minutes from last month's meeting. If everybody could, if you haven't already taken a look, if you could take a look. So if everybody's got a copy, uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. And then a second motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. Uh, financial report, Jim Parker. All right, uh, we began the month with $251.30, and we ended the month with $541.99. However, three hundred dollars of that is for parking. So that's going to say that way. We still need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, officers' reports. Anything, Dennis? Anything? Municipal elections this year. Municipal elections this year. Okay. Uh, anything else? Okay. Announcements. We do have the Lowndes County Democratic Barbecue coming up Tuesday, July 7th. Uh, you can go online and purchase tickets for this event. Uh, we do have DeBose Porter, who is the Democrat, Democratic Party of Georgia chairman. Uh, so that's pretty exciting that he's going to be coming down to visit us. We're going to have a lot of great speakers, local elected officials, Democrat as well as Republican, are going to be speaking with us. So if you could, uh, you can talk with Gretchen uh, if you're interested in getting tickets now. We're also looking for some folks to, who can help us set up and clean up. This is going to be at Mathis Auditorium, again, Tuesday, July 7th. Uh, I'm going to pass this around. The setup is going to be about 10 a.m. on that day. Cleanup is 8.30. So if you could lend a hand, we would really appreciate it. So, Jim, would you mind passing that around? Uh, other announcements? Are there any other announcements? Yes, J.D. I've got one on the 27th of this month, uh, which is the last Saturday of June. Uh, okay. We're having a, uh, a campaign rally and voter registration drive at Scott Park uh, from 11 o'clock in the morning to 2. That's the 27th of June of this month. Uh, everybody's invited because we've got free food to, to carry over through lunch, but we're looking for a large crowd, hopefully. Uh, you, you can all attend. Any other announcements? Yep. Yes, this Monday, thank you, John. This Monday, we're going to be doing a phone bank. Uh, we're looking for some folks to make some calls. We're a little bit behind on our bills at our headquarters on Slater Street, so we're hoping you could spend uh, just an hour and a half. Uh, what were the times again? From 6.30 till 8. 6.30 till 8. But, but the real thing we're calling for is to call to invite people to the barbecue. So the call goes like this. Hi, this is Gretchen. I'm calling to invite you to the barbecue. It's going to be July the 7th. Please come. It's simple. Um, and call your friends. Invite them. Uh, Reverend Rose just sent us save the date for He's got a thing coming. He's calling people for his event. So this is our event. Um, come out and help us to call people to invite them to our event. 
So uh, if anybody could do that, if you're interested in to talk with me or Gretchen, uh, we could really use your help. There's already a few of us who have agreed to do this. This is our big annual event, so we need a lot of people there, a lot of excitement. Anything else? Announcements? So tonight's topic, uh, environmental issues and property rights. Uh, I passed out, I printed these out, some slides. Uh, you know, I teach at VSU Sociology. We talk a lot about social problems, and some of the things we talk about are, are the increased amount of trash uh, that we've been making. Um, you know, we're about, United States citizens are 5% of the world's population, but we create 30% of the world's trash. Uh, this is becoming a growing problem. If you haven't heard, there's something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. There's garbage that actually floats in the ocean, kind of circulates, and, uh, and all the oceans have them. Um, and so there are some possible things that we could do, some policy initiatives, uh, mandatory bottle deposits. When I was in Connecticut, you pay five cents up front if you return it. Uh, you get your five cents back, these types of things. Um, working to ban plastic bags, there are some states that are working on that now. Um, and so some of our speakers are going to be talking about these issues and maybe some of the things that we can do at the local, state, and national level to kind of uh, to reduce our ecological footprint on the planet. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have Bill Slaughter, who's the chairman of the Lowndes County Commission. <coughs> appreciate you coming tonight. We have uh, John Quarterman, who is the president of Walls um, Watershed Coalition. We have uh, Dr. Michael Knoll, who is president, president, right? Wiregrass activist for clean energy. Uh, Deborah Johnson is from Spectra Busters, board member. And we have Ben Veith, who is a member of SAVE, Students Against Violating the Environment. So. They're coming from a different perspective, but they're going to share some insight onto these, into these issues. So I want to start off actually asking um, Chairman Slaughter a few questions about local issues. Uh, recently, there's been a loss of roadside recycling outside of the city, and I've been talking with some folks who are not thrilled about that. Uh, I guess there's a couple of stations that you can drive to and recycle, but for some folks, it's a bit of a drive to get out there, and it's kind of a hassle. Uh, where, first of all, where are these recycling stations, and is there, what can we do to get roadside recycling reinstated out in the county? Tom, thank you. First off, I want to tell you how thrilled I am to be here, and I appreciate the invitation, and I apologize that I couldn't make last month's meeting had a conflict. Uh, you find out real quick when you start getting into local politics that your time uh, it has a big demand on it, and you just can't be everywhere all the time. Uh, but again, I certainly appreciated the opportunity that was, that was uh, given to me last month, and then certainly Paul Thomas, I'd be glad to do it another time. So again, I appreciate the opportunity. First off, um, to address the recycling issue that we currently have in Lambs County. What we currently have, and the, and, and the industry had adopted is called single stream recycle and that is basically where all of your qualified recyclables go into one container in the unincorporated areas of Lowndes County that was the blue containers that you had if you're in the unincorporated area the issue is is that you've got to you yourself takes a, a lot of effort to do recycling you embrace it yourself, your family, inside your home, and you do everything that you need to do from a recycling standpoint to put proper items inside that blue container. On the day that this to be picked up, you roll it out to the street and it's picked up, the truck comes along and dumps it into a truck. Your neighbor on the other hand over here also has a blue container. They hadn't quite um, embraced recycling quite as well as you have and understand exactly what needs to be done. So in some cases, just about everything that you can think of goes inside the blue container. That same truck picks up that same blue container to the neighbors, dumps it in the truck. Well then, of course, you've got a recycling company that the truck has to go and dump the product out to, put it into <coughs> sort through those recycling problems. The problem is, is that they get 
contaminated loads. And that was what we were experiencing in, in Lowndes County. First off, the city of Aldosta was handling the recyclables. They rejected it. Said we can't take any more because it's too contaminated. They then started hauling it to Milledgeville to a recycling center, and eventually the same results happened. Then they attempted to send test loads to Ocala and to Orlando, and they failed as well. So it wasn't an issue of can we recycle, it's the single stream recycling, which in essence, if you're going to do it at the curbside, that's about the only way you can really do it. Um, and by doing that, everybody in the county was not embracing recycling the same way. So consequently, the, the vendor had to make a decision that they had to change the way recycling was done in Lambs County. Of course, through the whole process, if you've been keeping up with it, um, through negotiations with advanced disposal, through those negotiations, we were able to get a second vendor to be able to pick up, which is Deep South. And with those discussions, they agreed to open up the collection centers. Now, there's no limit on the collection centers that they can open up. And they really don't even have to open up a collection center. But if they didn't open up the collection center, they would have to continue to provide um, curbside pickup for recyclables as well. But the difference is, is that when you go to a recyclable center and you take your materials, you have a bin for metals, you have a bin for plastics, and you have a bin for cardboard product. It's put there at that point. So those bins are hauled off as that product. There is no co-mingling, there's no other household garbage, there's no yard debris, there's nothing else that goes in those bins except true recyclable products. So by doing this, we're now actually doing a better job in Lowndes County of recycling in this county because we are getting them separated at the collection centers. Because when those truckloads were rejected, the vendor had no other option than to put the whole truckload in the landfill. Now here you are as a homeowner and an individual that has embraced recycling and truly wanted to do recycling and then now you do all that effort inside your home but yet because your neighbor did not do that, your efforts are thrown away because the truck is rejected at the centers and then has to be dumped into the landfill anyway. So all of your efforts have gone for naught. So the county commissioners, we just felt like that the best thing to do was to go back to the collection centers. That's the way that the vendors both recommended that that's the way it should be done because they could control what was going in those bins and that there were no co-mingling, so consequently we ended up doing a better job of recycling. Those locations, um, our uh, advanced disposal uh, initially opened up two centers. They opened up a center down in the Lake Park area at the corner of Lock Laurel Road and Highway 376. They also opened up the center at Pine Grove, it was called Pine Grove Elementary Center. Um, they have those two. Deep South chose to open up one, and they've opened up the site at the Industrial Boulevard, which is out by the State Patrol Office and the Animal Shelter, right next door to it. So both of them chose to operate the, uh, the collection centers, and currently that's how we're doing the, the recycling at this point right now. The third part of that question is, what can we do to get it back to curbside? I'll be honest with you, I don't really have the answer to that question. That's ultimately, at the end of the day, is going to come down to what the vendors are able to do and what the citizens are able to do. They can't back up. It's not going to do them any good at all to go back to the collection the way they were doing it. And it failed. And then we're not, then we're not doing recycling at all because the method that's in place it's not a good method and it fails. They had discussed the possibility of utilizing something such as a, a smaller bin uh, that was clear, translucent, so they could look inside of it to see actually what the product was. 
again, the decision has to be made when you're there with a truck with recyclables, do you leave it sitting on the curb or do you dump it? So that it gets very, very complicated about how that they can handle it, but those professionals have to come up with that, that process. And until we as a whole, as a whole citizen and a whole community, does a better job with trash, our own trash, with throwing it out the windows, with putting it in containers that basically it's not meant to, so that uh, animals and different things can get into it and screw it and throw it around. But at the same point, we've got to, as a society, take a better look at ourselves and our community and, and say to ourselves, if this is what we want our community to look like. If it's not, and until we start making those efforts, then we're going to continue to go down this path of struggling, not just with recyclables, but trash as well. Yes, if I'll, maybe some, somebody else could answer as well. How do other cities or counties deal with this? Because no matter where you are, there's going to be people who are mixing things that should be mixed. And are there people are there whose jobs it is to pick out recyclable versus not recyclable? I mean, how is somebody familiar with well, that? I mean, I'll be glad to help you with it. Um, <laughs> basically, that's what they do at the recyclable centers is that the, the, the trash goes to the center, it's dumped out onto a floor, and then it's sorted through. Some of it is sorted through down a mechanical line where the product is moving down the line and you have sorters. Uh, I'm sure there's other processes for metals to pull the metals out of the plastics and the paper, and then they sort it that way. So it is a process that they have to go through in order to accomplish that. Uh, they, and, and you have to give, but I don't know exactly what that formula is, but certainly there is, there is a ratio of a certain amount of contaminated garbage that would be mixed in there that's allowable. Once you get above that allowable amount, then it no longer is profitable for them to sit there and pull out all that garbage and then they have to dispose of the garbage themselves. Appreciate it. Uh, if I can uh, ask a follow-up question. Chairman Slaughter here. Uh, I was living out on Rocky Fork Road and there's people throwing trash out all the time. Really frustrating, uh, especially out in the county. Uh, and I know, I think, I believe it was prisoners who were picking up the trash for a while and then now it's changed. I think there's companies that are sponsoring it, the Langdale, I'm saying I'm Rocky Ford, the Langdale company, or who, who's actually responsible for that now? There's still a process that's in place with the county for picking up the trash. Um, Basically, what you're what you're referring to is that we do have an adopt a highway program uh, in Lambs County to where a an individual, even or an organization, can adopt a highway, and then you basically keep <coughs> keep that stretch of the road. Up. The process is is that of course we have mowing <coughs> crews. Lambs County has a mowing crew that mows onto the north end of the county. And then they contract with a company, Kilgore, to do the mowing on the south end of the county. Prior to them doing the mowing, and it takes about five weeks for them to make a complete cycle on the mowing process. You have seen them probably before, the, the, uh, especially on the weekends, the, the uh, bus with the probationers. They utilize that process for those folks that want to be able to uh, fill some of their uh, community service requirements, they allow them to go out and they go out ahead of the mowing and pick this trash up. Uh, certainly there's some small stuff I'm sure that's going to, you know, but the bulk of the items to keep a mower from just chewing it up and making it uh, much more unsightly. That's the process that they have now. I know you've been through the unincorporated areas. Occasionally you'll go by and you'll just see the plastic bags sitting on the side of the road with the uh, trash in it. And that's what's happening. So that currently is the process we have. And apparently, it also understood this prisoner or someone because <clears throat> there were prisoners picking up trash in the court of the Okay. Uh, just a question, a comment. Uh, did the uh, did the advanced disposal or seven did any of those approach people who had difficulties to do the right recycling, put all the contaminants into the recycling bin, in terms of educating them how to do it. And another follow-up. <laughs> well, my understanding, my understanding is, is that yes, they, now Deep South, um, did not do recycling at all. 
prior to them coming in as a franchisee for the county. Once they came as a franchisee, then they also had to start recycling. So they do, they're doing that at the collection center. Uh, advanced disposal from their standpoint, because this had come up before, they had uh, through their mailings, and again, they do, I believe it's quarterly billing, and through that quarterly billing process, then they would, they tried to educate folks on how you do your recyclables. And they found a container that, that was not being used properly. Let's just say it had a bag of garbage sitting right on top of it. They would not pick it up. And then they would in turn then leave a note or something to identify that so that those folks would know, have an opportunity to communicate with them. To my knowledge, that's really what they, I know that they've done some stuff on some radio talk shows and have talked about it in the past. So to what extent, I can't really say to what they, how they've done their business. And um, a quick follow-up was just my wife comes from New Jersey and they have basically had similar issues there too and they did a fairly extensive ex educational program in terms of uh, telling people what they can and cannot do and if they would not be following uh, the guidelines, they would actually put a sticker on the garbage container so the whole neighborhood would be able to see that they were not doing a good job. Shame. So shame on you. <laughs> Shame could be a powerful tool. Uh, so to open up the discussion a little bit, <laughs> I'd like to hear from uh, some of our speakers. Uh, basically, uh, they're going to talk a little bit about the organizations that they represent, what they do, and maybe talk about one or two initiatives that they've been working on. And then we'll open it up for discussions, any questions you have, either about environmental issues or property rights. So let's we'll start with Deborah, if that's OK. Hi, my name is Deborah Johnson. It's an honor and pleasure to join you here. Or, or, or spectra busters. Uh, we are a multi-state entity, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Our board consists of members from all three states. We have Mr. Alton Burns from Thomas, Georgia. We have uh, Beth Gordon from Lady County in Wollaston, Florida. We have Garrett Kaiser from Auburn University. We have Adriana Taylor at Valdosta State University. And we have John Porterman of Lowndes County. I'm Deborah Johnson. I'm from Swanee County. All seven pipeline routes will run through on my county. Our, excuse me, our county. <laughs> our county. Um, we're a nonprofit, educational, nonpartisan group for all three states. Uh, some initiatives we've done we've mapped the pipeline. Uh, up to, uh, in uh, almost all the counties, up to one half mile out from each pipeline. Uh, in Swanee County, we did do mass mailings of 300 letters to landowners that were affected by the pipeline. Um, we have social media blogs. Uh, we have a blog and we have social media efforts going on. We attend landowner um, court cases in which Spectra Energy, who owns Sable Trails, tends to sue landowners. Uh, we protest and um, other have signs, anybody wants to ask a question? You want to go down the line and you open up? Good evening. My name is Benjamin Beeth, and I'm here representing Students Against Violating the Environment. We are an advocacy group for the environment. Uh, we do education. Um, we also host Earth Day. Um, currently, we're working on a couple of campaigns. One of them is to get the university to divest its holdings in the top 200 fossil fuel extraction companies. Um, we think it's a little antithetical to uh, the twin ethos of leadership and stewardship the public universities engage in for them to be teaching us about the ecological harm, environmental degradation, and human suffering attached to climate change, to be teaching us about that and at the same time profiting off of it. Um, it's a little bit disingenuous um, and certainly immoral. So we're working on convincing the university to divest its holdings there. Um, we're also partnering with a number of other groups and uh, coming uh, uniting against uh, the pipeline that Sable Trail is trying to build through here. Um, we've worked in the past with a number of organizations uh, to prevent, for instance, the biomass plant um, that they tried to build here. So we commend uh, the county and the city for not engaging in that endeavor and we're looking um, to just generate more support against this pipeline. Thank you. Can you get a victory with the divestment over the last, uh, last fall? That's right. There was a 
So just to, to update you on where we are with divestment, uh, the university, uh, the Student Government Association, the Faculty Senate, and the Environmental Issues Committee for the university have all looked at this issue and have all agreed that divestment is the way to go. Um, there's a handful of leaders at the top of the institution that have blocked us from divesting, and so they put together a special committee on campus sustainability. That committee looked at the issue of divestment and also agreed that divestment is the way to go. Um, so we're hoping that the university quits uh, engaging and erecting these kind of roadblocks for us and just moves ahead with what the community and with what the campus wants. Bill Slaughter, Lowndes County Commission Chairman, and again, it's my honor and privilege to serve the citizens, all the citizens of Lowndes County. Aren't you a member of that Oh, I was sitting on Yeah. I'm with the uh, Walls Watershed Coalition. Can't hear you. Walls Watershed Coalition. <laughs> Thank you. It's a matter here. Walls, as in Withacoochee, Willacoochee, Lapaha, and Little River Systems. Try saying any of those names in Atlanta, I don't know what. <laughs> but we all know what those rivers are. And we're very happy that this is off the presses today. It's the Lapaha River Water Trail brochure. And it's on all about things like if you, uh, you know, etiquette, if you go on the river, pick up after yourself. You take it in, take it out. We also do actual cleanups on the river. We did several last year and we have outings pretty much every month. Uh, that's, uh, this is about the Alapaha River. We're about to start doing a water trail for the Wifikuchi Little Rivers. And we're looking for people to help with that. There's all sorts of things that need to be done. Uh, what uh, points on the river, go out and talk to likely organizations that want to participate. And this one, we're proud to say that uh, the Valdosta Lyons County Chamber of Commerce, Valdosta Lyons County Tourism Authority, the Valdosta Lyons Development Authority all supported this water trail as did Hamilton County, Florida, and the Swanee River Water Management District. Um, here's a trivia question for you. What's the biggest city in the entire Swanee River watershed, in Florida or Jordan? Nope. Swanee. Yes, I meant Swanee River. I did not know this until last year. You're sitting there. It's spelled out. The second one is Timber. Third largest is Moultrie. There's nothing in the Swanee River watershed in Florida that approaches the size of Moultrie. Okay, um, so we do other things like uh, two of our Walls board members went to uh, <coughs> the testified before the Public Service Commission in 2013 to assist in the decision that they made in July to require George Power to buy twice as much solar power as they had previously wanted to. Uh, speaking of that pipeline, uh, Walls has been opposing that since pretty much the beginning. And um, Thursday, two Walls board members, they passed some from Tifton and me, went over there. And uh, there was a, a hearing where Sable Trail is suing a Georgia Centennial family farm owner. Uh, I'm sure the family would like all your support as well. So we do a bunch of other things, but that's uh, a sample. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, very nice to be here and see quite a few familiar faces, too. My name is uh, Michael Knoll. I am uh, the president of Wine Cross in Clean Energy. And this world is an organization that goes back really in its beginning, before it even got the name, to the year 2009, when we learned for the first time they had a mind to build a biomass plant. Then we ultimately formed in 2010 and got our act together, getting organized, reaching out to the community, to churches, to any kind of entity you can imagine that helps us to fight what was once considered a, a done deal. And I have still an old sign here with me, a sensor behind it, kind of at the wall when there was the sign read at that time, biomass, question mark, no. And although we were told that this was a, uh, a done deal, it turned out to be a dead deal, which goes to tell you simply that once a community is able to get organized, and focus its efforts on education and also uh, convincing its elected representatives to do the right thing that's ultimately what will happen. And so I'm always an optimist and, I always, and I've learned also from my friend uh, Reverend Rosen in the back that 
there may be uh, large monstrosities out there which have the stamina of a bear, but if you come at the bear from all sorts of angles and, and from different perspectives, you ultimately, as the small citizen or the small groups, will be able to wear that bear down and, and basically stop such a thing like a biomass plant. Now, the biomass plant ultimately was dead basically already at some point in 2011, and then we uh, focused as wine was to clean energy, our efforts to basically educate people on such things as solar energy. I've been pushing for this now for years, and only now does it seem that we are finally seeing the light, the solar light, at the end of the tunnel. And a lot of things are happening that are very exciting. In the meantime, though, the Sable Tail Pipeline came about, and they wanted to build this one right through our neighborhoods. That's when we get together with various groups, uh, ultimately, that are all one way or the other organized and connected with Spectre Busters. And um, finally, as NOAA became a pipeline now, and, and we can stop that too. It's a little bit of a bigger project happens to be worth almost $4 billion, which is a little bit more than $110 million that the biomass plant was worth. Uh, as the Dalai Lama said at some point, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. <laughs> Likewise, uh, we as a community, if we all get together and realize <coughs> that we have one common goal, we can change that. We can stop it. And I have to thank you publicly also, Chairman Slaughter, the county commissions, as well as the city of Waldoster, who ultimately support us in this effort, all of us. Spectra busters, whatever we are called, individual makes no difference. We have the same common goal. We want to stop something that is violating property rights, that is basically threatening our lives, and it is in the context of a global climate change that cannot be denied unless you are sticking your head into the sand and not pay attention to the details out there. By the way, that sand is getting wetter and wetter as the seawater levels are rising. So sand may not be anymore, it might not also have water. Right? Anyway, um, I'm glad to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, uh, we can open it up for questions. Does anybody have any questions about local environmental issues, Valdosta, the county, or pipe property rights issues, J.D.? I, I've got two. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, has, a, has the, one commissioner has considered uh, adopting uh, uh, a, a burning, open burning permit process that a lot, you know, especially in high density populated areas, you know, right now you can basically burn what you want, when you want in the county, unregulated, but have y'all thought about doing, adopting do. something? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rice, we do have a burning ordinance in the county as well, and of course, uh, to quote the burning ordinance verbatim, I, I won't be able to do that, uh, but yeah, you have to get a permit before you can burn uh, in the unincorporated areas. Of right, right. I understand that from forestry, but I mean that uh, right oh. now, if you get a permit from forestry, you can you can basically bring what you want because nobody comes out and check. But if I was thinking if you had the, a regulation that said you couldn't burn uh, treated wood or plastics or tires or something like that. Well, you actually you do uh, because I tried it <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't work. You know because uh, you can't burn any kind of building product. Uh, certainly, uh, EPA regulations prevent the burning of tires. Right. I mean, those there's already. Uh, regulations in place that prevents a lot of that. Uh, you really, the only thing that you can burn inside the unincorporated area of the Lowndes County and do it legally uh, is yard debris. That's actually all you can actually burn. Okay. And my second question was, I know the city's spending a lot of money on this uh, forced water main project. Uh, have they been working with the county to, to address untreated sewage that's coming out of the treatment plant that runs through on the corporate in Lowndes County? Well, I hope so, uh, because it is a concern, and if, if most people that uh, that recall, and there was very little that was actually said about it, when we uh, started discussion after I had taken office uh, with Mayor Gale, we discussed, of course, SPLOS 7 at that time. Of course, SPLOS 7 was huge for the city of Aldosta to be able to get that wastewater treatment plant funded. They needed SPLOS to be able to do that. Um, so I, I felt strongly about it as well. Even though that was a city project, there was no doubt that it was affecting citizens in the unincorporated area, as you said. It's not an issue about the flooding because the, the wastewater plant really had nothing to do with flooding. Um, but when you get flooded with waters that's got unimaginable things in it, that's a whole different issue. And those, those uh, the waste was actually coming out of the, 
the lines because of the four lines of uh, them getting influted and then of course eventually they just have to release it at, to a certain point and it goes on back into the into the river system which is not a good thing but ultimately that's what the result of the flooding is through that process of negotiating I felt like that it was a, that that wastewater treatment plant was just as important to folks in the unincorporated area that I agreed to move splash dollars, total of five million of those splash dollars, over to the city's side to help pay for uh, the wastewater treatment plant. So you're absolutely right. Whatever happens in the city, of course, number one, I say this all along. And I don't mean this to be negative, but I just say from the standpoint of local city government and municipalities, they only have to look to the city limit side. Lowndes County and county commissioners have to look past the city limit signs and through that city limit sign and right on through the next city limits. Of course, they cover all of Lowndes County. <coughs> so there definitely is things in place, the House Bill 489, of course, that limits certain things that you duplication of services. There are still things that we can work together on and cooperate together with to make it better for all the citizens in Lowndes County. And I hope that that's what I'm able to accomplish. Yeah. Um, again, for Chairman Slaughter, <laughs> changing subject to Sable and Trail, I wonder what is the County Commission's feelings and stance on this? And also, I wondered if uh, y'all could ask the governor to oppose this and DOT. I saw another area of Georgia where they're talking about a pipeline on the coast. The governor came out against it and everybody and I thought, well, what y'all do? <laughs> so I wondered how y'all felt the you done that. Well, as Mr. Hochschild initially said, we, we did come out um, with a resolution opposing the Sable Trail pipeline. Um, it's a very difficult issue. Um, of course, depending on which side that you're on. If you're a property owner, you have a whole different insight to that particular situation than someone that's not necessarily a property owner. Property rights are huge, and we just discussed it or had a brief discussion about it a few minutes ago. We still have laws in this country with a civilized community. As long as we have those laws in place, sometimes they're going to protect us, and sometimes they're going to hurt us. But they're the laws that we have, they're the laws that we've adopted, and it's what we ultimately, at the end of the day, have to live with. My position, at the end of the day, with the Sable Trail Pipeline was, I still would say this in any company, I feel like that pipelines, if you have to move petroleum around through this country, the pipeline is the best way to do that. However, I don't feel like bringing it through Lowndes County without any citizen in Lowndes County getting a benefit from the pipeline. The only benefit are the folks down in Florida, and the only ones that's, that's getting a benefit, they're getting a negative issue with the fact that the pipeline is having to come through their property and they, they lose the ability to utilize that property to its fullest extent. That was ultimately, at the end of the day, what my position was on it, and typically the rest of the commission as well. They felt the same way. We spoke to our local delegation, uh, state senator um, and state representatives about that, and they told us that they were going to talk to the governor about it. And that's where we, we we didn't make a formal request as a commission to the governor. We didn't do that, but we did speak to our local delegation, and they were going to move forward on their side. I can't say whether that's been done or not. I do not. Can you follow up on that? Certainly, be glad to. And in the context of the uh, recent event that uh, you described when the governor... The microphone. Thank you, Richard. And in the context of a fairly recent decision where the governor actually did speak out against a pipeline, this may actually be a good time to also consider maybe to, as a county commission, to direct appeal to the governor so that you have the direct connections and direct reply, whether or not it's positive or negative. I agree. I think the timing would be really good to ask him, and I would suggest that y'all consider it as a citizen. Uh, in the other direction, I would have to say that. I'm going to say that. 
to uh, talk to some of the opponents of the Palmetto Pipeline over there, and they're very interested in assisting and opposing the Safe Trail Pipeline. Uh, a huge thing that happened over there is, you know how Sable Trail hasn't been too careful about whose land they go on and whether they've been told not to or not? Well, Kendra Morgan did the same thing, but they uh, backed up to turn around off the public road 1.7 miles into the property of the owner of the Augusta Chronicle and his man of news. <laughs> And it's curious how the governor came out against uh, Palmetto Pipeline just after he went to Augusta, where this fellow lives. <laughs> but nonetheless, the governor and the lieutenant governor, both of whom had taken campaign finance money from multiple pipelines, they both came out against that one. Basically because, exactly what the chairman was saying, there's no benefit to Georgia, nothing but hazards. So, same trail, sure, that's that bill. I realize uh, Mouse County Commissioners and um, the city of Mel uh, I'm sorry, Valdosta has passed resolutions against the same with my club. I'd like to ask you to consider passing an ordinance. It's an ordinance that's law. It would hold more water and put a bigger barrier between this pipeline and the people in your city and your county and be a leader in this and um, have the other counties follow you that have already passed resolutions. Certainly, as through the early process, that was part of the consideration. Um, however, um, through the process of both consulting as much as anything with the county attorney, uh, he said the ordinance would do absolutely no good at all because it was just going to end up being a decision that was that would ultimately ultimately be made at the state level. Um, I, I disagree with them. I do. I, I believe local government has more power than, than the state than it thinks it does. And I think an ordinance um, can stop, at least pause, a corporation of this size. They would have to take that to court. That might be a fear factor on your part. It is on this county commissioner's part. I would agree. Um, but I still think that it uh, has sent a strong message. And um, I disagree that it's not going to be good, that the state is going to be mailed the state level, because actually it's the federal level. FERC decides if the pipeline is in need of necessity for the state of Georgia or, or Alabama. Thank you. Well, along those, what, what we actually did, or what I had done, as you recall earlier, the comments that were made to FERC, I sent comments to FERC as well chairman of the county commission and fairly lengthy, lengthy laid out exactly what ordinances we already have in place that they would be required to abide by what ordinances also that I would that I felt like that uh, we could support and I believe it was talk with the county that initially said that the board should be at five foot of depth uh, I supported that as well um, and so we, it was a very lengthy input from the county engineer, uh, from the utilities department, as far as conflict with county utilities, with road crossings, all of those issues of exactly what they would have to do if they came into Lowndes County. And I can assure you, it's about as restrictive as you can possibly make it, because it did cover just about every base that was out there. And uh, I would be glad to, of course, they're all, you get them off the comment page of this report. Let me add something completely different, and again, uh, my appreciation for all that what the county commissioners have done in this regard. Uh, the way this discussion is going, we're trying to find a magic bullet, the one entity that can stop a pipeline. We'll never find anything like it. You have uh, to find various ways to go about it. We have a lot of different kinds of allies forming or popping up that we sometimes do not anticipate. Uh, sometimes they can be in the form of landowners who all of a sudden realize that they are now in fact the two. They have more muscles than others because they maybe have more influence on money. Sometimes it's a simple development as what you've seen lately in terms of the solar energy market. 
uh, when you look at solar energy in general, it has improved so immensely that now we have companies like Duke Energy, for example, who are realizing that solar energy is actually the path for the future. And if uh, Duke Energy, one, one of the larger companies also involved in the state of Florida, as the seven larger power companies in Florida are realizing that the future is solar, that more and more undermines ultimately their argument that we need to have fossil fuels in whatever form <coughs> they can, that may uh, be available out there. Uh, because it's really meant to, more or less, we know that now for sure, we knew that already before, it's really only for exports what would be necessary. You want to bring it to places like Europe or Asia, perhaps. Florida is the sunshine state for crying out loud. We're not that far off in terms of our solar potentials in the state of Georgia. If you look at the development of the solar energy, we're so close to the revolution that Dr. Thomas Edison already envisioned in 1931 when he essentially said, my God, what a, what a source of power we have in the sun. I hope we realize that and utilize the source of power before we run out of oil or coal. Of course, he didn't know yet about such things as global climate change or the kind of pollution that comes with fracking or the, the burning of, of coal, for example. So I'm a very optimistic and original in this regard. So on one hand, we, do, we need to have county commissioners maybe sending a letter to a governor. But we also have to have, as consumers, contact and other representatives showing the way in a different direction. Educating ourselves about everything from recycling to renewable forms of energy to energy efficiency. Because like it or not, the door is open, the windows are open, this building is poorly insulated, and we're wasting essentially up to 30% of energy, which we could easily say if we had more energy efficient buildings. Just the same way, and this was an article this morning, and I think the world does it the other times, you have the way that we're wasting food. 30 to 40% of our foodstuffs goes into waste. We are an incredibly wasteful society. If we just are a little bit more the stewards we're asked to be somewhere in that old or New Testament of ours, we'd be coming a long way. But, and, and, and we can. There's many opportunities. But it isn't just one bullet. I don't want to have all the pressure on Chairman Slaughter. He has to have a little pressure. But there's also some pressure on us in doing what we can to get this thing rolling. And we are already seeing that. I'm in contact with a lot of people, folks around the country, really where you see the solar revolution that has already been ongoing for really the last two or three decades, two or three years in many ways, is now coming to the point where nobody can deny the fact that we now not only have solar panels that are less expensive than ever have been, one watt hour is less than three dollars installed ultimately. We also now have the storage capacity, the Tesla battery, power wall. So there's a lot of things happening that are going in the right direction, all undermining all this insanity of fossil fuels which are finite, which are polluting the environment, and not serving us diddly squat, just some folks who have a company in Texas and a governor with shares in that company in Texas. That's the corruption, that's the mindsets we have to fight. We can't. It's much easier than you think. You just have to do it. Sorry. Uh, One minute. The Georgia, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of the Georgia Water Coalition. It's a group uh, with more than 200 uh, river keepers, other water-related organizations in the state of Georgia. Every year it puts out something called the Georgia Water Coalition Dirty Dozen. The Dirty Dozen 2014 had number nine, the Sable Trail Pipeline. That's because Walls proposed that Flint River Keeper and Chattahoochee River Keeper, both of which oppose pipeline by the way, and Greenlaw in Atlanta, and the Georgia River Network all, all opposed it. This apparently had some effect. Andrea Grover of Spectra said she was disappointed to see this. Well, we're disappointed in being invaded by pipeline companies from Houston, as that very dozen said. It's like the bull weevil, except worse, because the bull weevil at least didn't take your land. Um, Wednesday, I went to the Southern Company stockholder meeting. Does everybody know what the Southern Company is? Okay. Uh, George Power is more than half of it. It's also Alabama Power, Mississippi Power, Gulf Power, and Panhandle, Florida. Uh, Southern Company CEO Tom Fanning announced that he had that morning signed an agreement with Tesla for utility scale batteries. Fanning himself, for two years now, has been driving a Tesla. He's been distributing, uh, in his last year, electric vehicles to his uh, employees to drive around. And, um, well, here, here's another trivia question for you. Which state is the fastest growing solar market in the country? And Jim gave it away. It's Georgia. 
And that's very new. That's since um, yeah, 2014, it now is. Before that, it was nowhere near. And that's largely because of Georgia Power having to buy that additional amount of solar power. Now that they're doing it, they seem to like it. Um, so, my train of thought just ran right away there. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me compliment the chairman again. Uh, what the chairman and the commission have done is great. And um, the Wiles County Commission has shown leadership, as has the Austin City Council, which is appropriate. Because Lyles County is the most populous county on this pipeline path between Auburn and Alachua County, where Gainesville is. Gainesville is not actually, as far as not actually in the Swanee River watershed, so I didn't mention it before on the other question. So it's great that Lyles County is showing leadership. But just a couple more things worth thinking about. Um, and, you know, this one, any of you can do. There is a petition out there to ask the governor to do what he did for the Palmetto pipeline. Deborah has a copy of it there. Um, the Federal Energy Research Commi uh, Regulatory Commission, I can show you a decision by their commission where they say, whenever possible, county ordinances, they try not to abrogate. So you may actually have more power than you think. And in Jefferson County, Florida, when, uh, you know, Nestle sucks up water from Madison Blue Springs in Madison County, Florida. And they didn't want, you know, that wasn't enough for them. They wanted Jefferson County. Jefferson County first passed a resolution saying, you know, go away. Then it passed an ordinance rooted in its comprehensive plan that spelled out that only, you know, actual water utilities or private landowners and so forth can get water out of the aquifer. And that's a law. That's something very serious. And something like that could be a model for thinking about for landscape. The petition you're looking at is online at spectrobusters.org. Um, under petitions, there's several there, there, but that one is to uh, the governor, the honorable governor deal. Um, you are welcome to make copies of those and distribute them locally and hand sign them go door to door if you want to. Um, whatever you want to do with them. So what is the objective of Spectre seeing this private land? Do you expect to increase uh, the pressure of uh, Lowndes County? Actually, she refused their surveyors access to her property. Um, if they cannot access the property, they have to go around it. Uh, they're going to $586,000 on the figure they said. And they're strong-handed. They're, they're strong-hands. They're like, really trying to beat the local guy. Spectra, or Sable Trails, is simply a company of consultants. There's no employees of Sable Trails, per se. Uh, their surveyors are... <coughs> Uh, employees of a company called Encompass. Their uh, project director is an employee of something called NZM, I believe is the name of the company, or M NZ5. NZ5. Uh, I've looked it up. That is another consulting company. He's not a project director for Spectra, for Spectra or Segal Trails. And um, he doesn't even know where he lives, as a matter of fact. He told several lives to the job. So actually, it is. Oh, but what you're saying, strong handing the little man, and she would not let them on the property in this flat space to survey. <laughs> what they're specifically trying to get is a judge to say they have Georgia in the domain. They don't want to wait for a certificate from the firm, which would give them federal in the domain, I guess it's not true. They want to get a judge to say they already have Georgia in the domain. Which, according to the Georgia Code, they can only have that they're actually going to provide the gas to customers in Georgia. They made a deal, they, they announced they made a deal in November with the Metropolitan Gas Authority of Georgia, which supplies smaller cities like Moultrie and Albany. And, um, however, at that time, both Doherty County and Albany and Colquitt County had, as the chairman mentioned, passed resolutions against the pipeline, and Moultrie has since done so. So it looks very dubious that they'd actually be supplying gas to Georgia, but that doesn't stop them from suing landowners and trying to claim that they do anyway. Does anybody else have any questions about environmental issues or the pipeline? 
Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, uh, Georgia Power does have a lot of good programs for solar, especially buying back if you have solar panels on your home. But I would like to see more um, movement with some of the EMCs because Coughlin does not. In fact, I've, I've had to think multiple times, and as far as I can tell, they're just not doing anything to it. So there's no incentive because unless you can really invest in a big battery pack or something at your home, that energy is being wasted because it can't go back into the grid. So any pressure that you can put or enlightenment <coughs> might be a better word. Of course, the EMCs, I think, would be good, not just Georgia Power. If I may comment on that, uh, Cockwood EMC is the example we have here in town because uh, basically uh, one individual, uh, uh, George Bennett, uh, who is a friend of some of us here, I mean, most of you probably know him, he just got a six kilowatt uh, solar array on, a, on his house not that long ago. It was hardly on there maybe for two months. And he is a Cockwood EMC customer. And the six kilowatt installation cost him, if you to, to ta tax deduct or take the 30% uh, federal tax credit off basically cost them $16,000. That's certainly a cost up front that's not easy to swallow. You can't finance it though more easily because uh, fairly recently there also has been a new act that was passed and signed by Governor Deal in regard to the free marketing financing of solar energy projects like this. And basically uh, what the solar array does on this house, it covers pretty much uh, probably, although you will see for sure after about a year only, about 90% of its energy demands. So what you have is the electricity it makes feeds into the lower part of the panel, uh, distributes them throughout the house wherever the need is, whatever surplus there is will go into the grid. And then you get a pathetic, I think it's four cents per kilowatt hour, which is too low. It's much better when you go, for example, and work with Georgia Power uh, or other companies in this regard. But the point here is that he's saving on average probably throughout the year about 90% of its electricity bill. Now imagine you have, you look at your electricity bills and see what you consume, you can of course conserve stuff, that you would save about 90% of your electricity bills on average in your year. You have an idea how much money you save and then try to figure that into some kind of an investment to a solar array. Basically after about 10 years, he has paid off the solar panels. And then for the lifetime of the solar panels, which even if the warranty eventually expires, it goes up to 40 years, over the lifetime, average lifetime of the solar panel that he has, he will make more than $100,000, actually. So they may give you a bad rate, but if you're using much of the energy yourself, you may still use some of that energy that comes from Cockpit MC, because there are also going to be days when it's not a sunny or there's something called night, and you may not be able to afford the Tesla uh, Powerwall, which costs for 7 kilowatt 3000 for 10 kilowatt $10,000, excuse me, $3,500, $3,500. Uh, that is also worth an investment because then you can completely go off the grid in a way. But you don't have to be that fancy. 90% of your electricity bills cut off on average. It's a pretty good investment if you do that. That's uh, short for hydraulic fracturing. That's, uh, that's a methodology that was developed by Halliburton, which must be the reason why there's a Halliburton loophole there somewhere. Basically what you do is you have uh, shale formations which may contain fossil fuels like oil and natural gas. You've gotten some of that already out with uh, traditional uh, te or technology or conventional technology. And when you do hydraulic fracturing, you basically insert basically some kind of like a pipe into the ground, uh, into these shale formations, and then with high pressure you, you, you push in there uh, liquids that contain everything from sand to undisclosed chemical compounds to basically fracture or crack open fracture open and those layers to make the flow of the natural gas or oil more easy to the surface. But as you're injecting literally millions of gallons of highly toxic water that has stuff in it that you don't even know because they don't disclose it, that sometimes goes into, into a problem. The aquifer and may pollute uh, the, the, the water that you have as a homeowner somewhere up, up on top. And it's a big nightmare. And it's ultimately the last attempt of what I call it, a, you know, a dinosaur that's about to go extinct of a fossil fuel fuel industry to still squeeze out a little bit of profits before they realize the end of the fossil age has come. The beginning of the third solar age has finally arrived. They're just, just making the money as long as they can. And it's insane. It's hydraulic fracture. It's not, not really good. Until 2005, it was a crime, as it should be. That's when Dick Cheney and Halliburton got Congress to pass 
an exemption to the Clean Water Act. It should be a crime. A crime. We should get it changed back. Injecting diesel fuel and, and who knows what else into the aquifer we drink from. Oh, and did you know there's a shale gas basin under our feet, under most of South Georgia and North Florida? There's another one in Northwest Georgia. And the fossil fuel companies just love to track that. And wouldn't it be convenient if there was a pipeline in place already? And you know that uh, Dick Cheney was the former CEO of Halliburton, right? Yeah. yeah. There right. are connections, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have He's, he left. If it doesn't fit in your trash, if it isn't trash anyway, but if it doesn't fit in your trash, uh, do you have the chance to pay a ten dollar fee to have to pick it up? It doesn't also be a too bit ridiculous. You probably just bring it to their place. Or so. But uh, if it doesn't fit in a trash can, they won't, they won't pick it up. That's been my experience. But you have to ask the right answer. So I can go back to the EMCs for a moment. Um, all the EMCs and the city electric organizations and George Power supported HB 57, the solar law that passed, which passed unanimously in both houses of the legislature who signed by the governor recently. Now what this does is it lets you sell your power to someone other than your one and only designated utility designated by where you are geographically, which means things like what Solar City's been doing in many other states of they finance, install, maintain, and own solar panels on your roof while you pay them an amount less than you used to pay on your power bills that's paid off than it's yours. Now, that means that people won't have to do what Alan Burns did recently. He had to go out and take a mortgage to finance his solar installation, which shows you know, he really wanted to do it. Now people won't have to do that. He's on Brady EMC, and correct me if I'm wrong, you get six cents per kilowatt hour from them? I think that's the rate, I'm not sure. Right, and you pay them more, like 10? I think it's about 12 cents per right. kilowatt. Mm -hmm. And on Coco DMC, I have 15 kilowatts in my farm workshop. I pay them 10 cents per kilowatt hour, they pay me four and a half cents. So even though I make almost twice as much of what I buy from them, I still don't usually break even on a given month. But, you know, nonetheless, the, the EMCs actually did support that law along with George Power. Oh, and another announcement at the Southern Company Stockholder meeting, as one fellow, Sam Colley, has been going to that meeting for a dozen years, literally, and asking the same question every year, when can I buy solar panels from Southern Company to put on my roof? The answer this time was July. So that, that's a good thing. Uh, just one more solar thing. Imagine you have a chessboard. You put a penny on the first square. You put two pennies on the next square. Four on the next. Eight. Work that out and see how much money you got at the end. You have billions of dollars. Solar power deployment in this country is doubling every two years. At that rate, if it continues, and there's no reason that it can't, Within 10 years, more electricity in this country will be generated from solar power than anything else. So why do we need pipelines? We don't. <coughs> Any other final questions? Yeah. I have a comment on the uh, job issues. You hear a lot of the oil companies and when the pipeline companies talk about the jobs it generates. I hired a gentleman named Mr. Ron Jackson with South Georgia Solar here in Vine Austin to come install my system. And that, in, that employed people. It was green jobs. And if, you know, if a lot of people were to have that, and I mean, you know, President Obama is, is teaching the soldiers, the veterans, training them in solar so that they will be prepared when they come out of the service to do the work. Our President Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House, and that was just phenomenal. But um, Ronald Reagan took them off. And his reason for taking them off was because they didn't produce a lump of coal, 
and uh, you know, our, our quart of oil. Well, they're not designed to produce oil or coal. That's the mindset that they had. Whereas if they had stuck with the solar program, we wouldn't be as dependent on the oil and all as we are now, and there would be clean jobs, and we wouldn't have these environmental issues, like what's going on with Duke Energy and what they did with the Dan River. They were warned about that pipeline for years before that pipeline ruptured, and it had polluted the Dan River up there. And Leslie, um, Leslie Stahl, she grilled Miss Linda Good with Duke Energy, and Miss, Miss Good said, we need more time to study. Well, what do you do with 60 years of coal ash and you've had plenty of time to study? But once the river is polluted or the aquifer is polluted, I don't care how many millions of dollars you put in that to clean up, there's no way of cleaning that up. So we need renewable energies and we need to start now. It's going to take people, people being like me, that was this, that much dedicated to get it. That's why I bet, I bet my farm on it. And now with HB 57, it'll make it a lot easier. And we have the technology available for all of this. It's mainly really an, a, a, challenge, a, well, a challenge we have in terms of changing the political and cultural mindset. We have everything in place. Uh, other countries, other states are doing it successfully. You have just the very few that are benefiting still from it. And too many of us not yet believing it is possible when we really already know and see it, it is possible. It's the same thing, the same skepticism we have in terms of our ability to fly. You know, 1783, the first hot air balloon goes up. 1903, the first motorized airplane takes up. 1969, the first landing on the moon. 2013, the first solar flight around, basically from one coast in the United States to the other with solar impulse. And this year, they're actually doing a, a circum, uh, you know, flight of the whole planet with a solar-powered airplane. Don't tell me it cannot be done. The technology and a wonderful smartphone that's in that, that's right on the, on the table here, has there's more stuff in here than it was in the 1969 Apollo mission, honestly. So it can be done, right? Uh, well, and uh, the city of Valdosta has recently discovered, uh, you know that they have a, a megawatt and third on the Mud Hill, uh, what's where, uh, treatment plant grounds. They've also recently discovered and ran the numbers that, hey, if we could put in a much larger plant, we could save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And, you know, I thought also already got an award last year as a green city for that and a number of other things I'm related to wastewater. Uh, let me interject that um, the wastewater situation, Walls recently asked the city of Valdosta to do a meeting to inform some people from Florida and some people from Atlanta about what was going on. And the mayor, a city council member, the uh, utilities director, the uh, assistant director of engineering, and the marketing person all showed up in also the Lions County chairman and a county, uh, county commissioner. So it's not, you know, uh, on the wastewater issue, the local governments are very responsive and it worked. Most of the people who are concerned are much less concerned. Now, if the city of Valdosta were to find a way to do this, put much more solar power on some of their locations, that would also be a beacon to indicate that it's a great thing to do. Uh, certain other local governments might want to consider that too because they have bond joint authority. And if it's going to be paid back in you know, uh, 10 years, then after that it's gravy and meanwhile power bills go down. Okay, here's a pending question, kind of a piggyback. Uh, in terms of uh, students, Mindset at VSU. I mean, what what's your perspective of are our students picking up on recycling? Is it becoming more popular from your experience? Are they are you helping to create awareness? Yeah, we're, uh, on our campus, recycling is a, a big issue for us. Um, I'm an '80s child myself. I was born in 1980, um, so uh, it's a little bit discouraging that we're still talking about recycling. Here it is, 2015, and we're still talking about this, but. We have taken steps, measures on our own campus. Um, so we have uh, the dorms uh, every semester competing against each other to see who can create the most tonnage and recyclable waste. We have, um, we're measuring our food waste at the campus every day. Um, we're trying to reduce that. Uh, so yes, we're tackling our number. Yeah, we have the give and go at the end of the semester. Uh, Dr. Oschild has organized that with the sociology club and a number of other student organizations. Uh, basically, um, students throw away everything that they can't carry back home in their uh, small compact cars, and a lot of that waste um, is still usable. 
So everything from furniture um, to paper, unused paper. Um, so uh, Dr. Oschild and Sociology Club collect that and we redistribute it in the county um, to areas in need. Um, and I also want to say that when it comes to hydraulic fracturing, uh, just to use Oklahoma as an example, they've been experimenting with fracturing here for about four years now. And the University of Oklahoma looked at seismic activity. Uh, Oklahoma would only have two seismic events every year, and they're experiencing at least two a week now um, since fracturing. Um, also, uh, fresh, clean, safe drinking water um, is an issue for uh, not just the planet, but also for the United States. We can look to California um, for that. Um, and when they hydraulically fracture, they use clean drinking water. Uh, drinking water that we could be using. They take that water, they irradiate it, they contaminate it, they pollute it, and they render it unusable. Um, so. If I could just add, we talk a lot about recycling, and recycling is fantastic, but also the reducing and the reusing. Sometimes we don't focus on that. Uh, reducing the amount of waste we create, the, the amount of products we buy with all the packaging and the plastic bags and the water bottles. Uh, but also doing things like Craigslist. These are things that you and I can do, right? Buying used things, reusing things, being thrifty. Uh, is there anybody, Billy, or something? I have a technical topic question. My concern is um, about what are they going to do about uh, how poor people and all the jails we are building. What about jobs in our community? Um, what I'm looking at now is that it costs about $7,000 to put a kid to school, and we're spending uh, eight, twelve to $30 to put them in jail, but we have no job. When a kid don't get a job and go to jail, we have to pay for them forever. So on our next, less, our next uh, meeting, can we bring up some topics on the education, jobs, and, and the poor, which really need a lot of help? Funny you mentioned that. I was going to talk with the other committee members about possibly making that uh, our next meeting, talking about education possibly next month. So uh, we'll get some panel speakers to talk about those issues. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, any other final questions on environment or property rights? And, yeah. I was just wondering, regarding the pipeline, where is the project that you're talking about? Because I know that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, what what part, what part are we in right now? How far is it going? What's next? Environmental impact. <coughs> Am I correct on that? They're supposed to come out with their environmental statement shortly. Right. They're supposed to be out with their environmental impact statement shortly. They submitted one. It was set back. And, and they were asked to make changes. Uh, John P. did that. I like that. And um, I call him John P. I can't pronounce his last name. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, John Pellerin, he's an environmental biologist. So right now we're just uh, waiting on that to happen to see if, uh, I guess, for the size is a public need and necessity. When they come out with the environmental assessment, they're supposed to have another series of scoping meetings. I strongly recommend everybody who can do those things and in comments. One thing about pushback pipeline people who are opposing the Palmetto pipeline is right from the beginning, it packs every meeting. The one I went to in Waynesboro, well, first the first meetings they had were basically, uh, they, they called them hearings, but they weren't. They were organized by Kendra Morgan. And uh, when Steve Cayley was Greenlaw in Atlanta, got them to admit those weren't real hearings. So then GDOT held two real hearings. The first one, they expected about 150 people, they got 600. The one I went to in Waynesboro, they had seats for 250 and at least 400 showed up. So if they have more meetings, please, please come help pack the meetings. And you know, don't think that nothing can be done. The same pipeline was going to cross our Wikipedia River again in Florida. It's not now because of activism in Hamilton County that persuaded them to move off the pipeline, move off the river. And uh, it's also not true that every pipeline project happens. The um, Bluegrass Pipeline in Kentucky by Williams Company, one of the companies involved in this mess that we got here, 
a judge said that they could not use Kentucky eminent domain, and there was massive public resistance, and Williams suspended the pipeline project. Spectra in Virginia was going to bid on a project run by Dominion. Multiple counties and cities passed resolutions against, and Spectra didn't even bid. And while FERC is, I don't know if you know this, 100% funded by the industries it uh, regulates, <laughs> Nonetheless, even FERC has denied two pipelines before. It could happen. And if it can convince the governor to come out against it, while FERC does the certificate of convenience and necessity, FERC requires multiple state agencies to weigh in. For example, Safe Trail applied for an air quality permit for the compressor station they would put in Albany. And they have to get from GDOT a permit for every state road they cross. So if GDOT and Georgia EBD were to deny those permits, that would be a little cramp in the pipeline. So I would like to open the meeting up uh, to members wishing to be heard. But first, I would like to thank all of our panel members. If you can put your hands together. <laughs> thank you for uh, sharing any information you have. And uh, on these information sheets that everybody hopefully has, there is contact information for all of these uh, fantastic organizations. So there's emails, phone numbers. I'm sure the members would love to talk with you uh, after the meeting if you have any questions or you'd like to join the organization, so please do that. So uh, could we open it up to uh, members wishing to be heard on any any topic, essentially? Jim? Okay, yeah, my name is Jim Parker, and I'm here to tell you I'm running for city council. And Yay. It. It's going to be for the at-large position, so anyone that lives in Valdosta could vote for me, and I ask you, please vote for me, okay? I'm in total in line with uh, all we've heard tonight, and if you know me, you'll know that too. And I, I'm looking forward to promoting three different items. One, I want to have greater transparency in the city government. They don't record these meetings yet. And I'd like to see that done, have them recorded, put up on the website. In fact, I'd even like to see them broadcast on Metro 17 Live and then rebroadcast over the next two weeks so that everybody <coughs> could check in when they, you know, in their convenience, DVR it even, and, and, and see it at your own convenience. Secondly, I'd like to see the council have town hall meetings in each of the districts throughout the year. And I'm at, going to be an at-large, the at-large position, and I intend to have that myself. And I hope the rest of the council will join me. <laughs> and if we do these two things, I think the city and the government, the city's government, and the citizens can come closer together. Secondly, I'm totally on board with public transportation. Public transportation is an idea whose time has come for Valdosta. Uh, I have a Facebook page that I set up. Uh, it's called Public Transportation for Valdosta, Georgia. And we have over, well over 100 likes now. Please tune into the page. Uh, public transportation will do so much for the economy that we can't even begin to, to, to get a, a grasp on it until it starts to happen. But time after time after time, and study after study has shown a public transportation system helps the economy of an area. And then um, finally, I want to see greater support for each of the neighborhoods, all of the neighborhoods. I want to see more sidewalks, bike paths, community gardens, and especially high-speed internet for all. We're into the 21st century. We have got to do something. This is this is part. These are part of my platforms. I'm intending to campaign throughout the city and get all everyone's concerned because I want to represent you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I'm sure Jim would, be, Jim would love to talk with you after the meeting if you have any questions or comments. Uh, any other members wishing to be heard? No? Well, thank you everybody for showing up. And uh, once again, thank you to our, uh, our panel speakers for taking the time out. Um, you do get free pizza for speaking tonight, so thank you for that. And hope to see everybody next month uh, for our meeting. And if anybody's interested in some Democrat Party bumper stickers, free for you. Come on up if you want. So yeah. thanks, everybody. See you next month, first Monday of every month. No, no. Last week you said something about the money. I got some. We'll take money. <laughs>
Oh, ne next on. month is the barbecue. Barbecue, on the barbecue. So I hope everybody's going to come to the barbecue. Devoe's Porter. Could <laughs> <laughs> be speaking. Yeah. <laughs>